I'm, I'm, I'm always glad to uh, interrupt the vacation for vocations. Um, and so it was, and it was so great to welcome uh, some of you to my home parish, the uh, uh, Church of Our Lady in Guelph. Uh, and uh, I, as you can see, Ben tonight, uh, I think that's where I get away to my, my hometown. Um, and so it's just great, great to be here. I just love being uh, together with Sarah's because of the tremendous mission in which we're all engaged and the astonishing importance that Sarah has in the life of the church. And so for that, I thank you all for the prayers you offer. As, uh, as earlier on, some of my younger colleagues were pointing out, and it's very true, it is the prayer is the heart of it all. The only thing our Lord ever said was pray the Lord of the heart was to send language into the harvest. All the other stuff is uh, it, it's extra, but it's, it's that's the heart of it all. And that's really the heart and center of the uh, vocation of, of Sarah. And so what I'd like to do is talk a bit about the theme, Witnesses of the Word. And um, think about a bit, witnesses, a bit of the word, uh, what it means to witness, to, to witness to Christ, and uh, to fulfill that in a way that, in a sense, our heavenly patron certainly shows us that way. He was witnessing to Christ through his, uh, through many, many difficulties and struggles and terrible difficulties. He constantly was there. He was always moving forward, ever onward, for the sake of the Lord. He was coming from the experience of Christ, moving outward always into that. And so that's what it is, is to be a witness to Christ. And what I'll do is I'll just, um, I have my little red Bible, because I think the Bible should be read. Um, <laughs> the red Bible there. I, I must say that uh, Father Newstead, my, my great friend and hero, I had two influences on me. One was he led me to the priest. He said, you don't talk, you should think about becoming a priest. Um, I was a little slow in figuring out what he was doing. He would take me to chrism masses, ordinations, and things. Finally, about 30 years later, I figured out what he was doing. But, uh, but he also got me very interested in English literature. To, to listen to John Henry Newstead uh, uh, read out the tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forest of the night. Woo! I got so interested, I thought, oh, I'm in English. So I, I, I inflict cruel and unusual punishment upon you. Which is forbidden in the United States, but it's not forbidden in Canada. <laughs> so, there we are. Uh, so what I'd just like to do is just um, flip two pages of Scripture. One thing I'm doing, by the way, I think, because I had an experience, uh, I won't go into details, uh, the fact that I think people talk about Jesus a lot, but they never seem to read the Gospel. Like, it's just when Bishop Sheen, when he got an Emmy or something, he said, I want to um, give thanks to my writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. <laughs> And I think mean, that's what we've got to get through. Read the gospel. You know, we've got this kind of meringue Jesus made out of some of you will say, do whatever you want and I'll validate it. That's just not the right thing, you know. We've got to read the gospel. The gospel of the Lord comforts us, certainly, but he challenges us. He calls us to change our lives. People dropped everything and followed him. That's what it's all about in terms of our life of discipleship. So we need to read, read the gospel, the real gospel, the actual thing. A chapter a day keeps the bishop away. <laughs> <laughs> this is my, this is my uh, homework, everyone. I'm an also former teacher. Read one chapter every single day of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I read the rest of God in the Bible, too. Maybe half an hour a day of reading, whatever. But read always a chapter of the real gospel. Read it aloud if you can, because that even touches the heart even more. So, witnesses. Here are just two pages of the Gospel. The last page of Luke and the first page of John. You just listen to the word witness. How important it is. And it's constant throughout the, the, the Bible. Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. And that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city till you are clothed with power from on high. And then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. And while he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple, blessing God. In the beginning was the word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life. The light was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. 
There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came for testimony to bear witness to the light that all may believe through him. He was not the light. He came to bear witness to the light. He was not the light. He came to bear witness to the light. That's what it's all about to be witnesses to the light, witnesses to the Word who is God, the Word who is the Lord. And then a bit further on, and we see this in all the Gospels, this just happens to be on the next day to the Gospel of John. The next day, John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him. He said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me, for he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this I came, baptizing with water, that he might be revealed to you. And John bore witness, I saw the Spirit descend as a dove from heaven and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. That's what it's all about. We're called to be witnesses of the Word, the Word who is the Lord, who became flesh and dwelt amongst us, who did not cling to his equality with God, but emptied himself, came into this world, that we might have life and have it to the full. We're called to be, as Christians, certainly in the specific mission of Sarah, we're called to be witnesses of the Word, the Word who is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The whole dynamic of our life in Christ and the Gospels comes from that movement between come and go. We come, come follow me, come and see, come, and especially the first chapter of the Gospel of John, come and see weekends, or come from the Gospel of John, Come and see, experience, be with the Lord. He didn't, his disciples or his students, his disciples are means that, it doesn't mean someone who sits in a classroom and takes notes. It's someone who lives with the Master. Come and see. That's the way it is. We get permeated with the experience of the Lord. And that's still in the Jewish tradition of what a student does with the Master. Come and live with the Master, live with the Rabbi. And you, but the difference is, students choose the master. The students of a rabbi choose the rabbi. When you're doing, uh, like I did a doctorate on the apocalypse, so again, it's just, if I live worried, you shouldn't worry. <laughs> um, I might know the day at the end of the world. I remember picking up a phone, a phone from uh, uh, London, Ontario, and I phoned Father Ugo Vani, the great Father Vani, who is also the uh, teacher of our uh, rector, friend of our seminary, Father Nuska. And I said, I'd like to do a doctorate with you. Would you be my teacher? Would you be my director? He said, oh, sir, come on over this afternoon. I said, well, there's very good telephone connections. I'm coming from, uh, calling from Canada, so I don't think I'll be able to do that, but I'll come, and I did come. So the students seek the master, but this is the case where the master sought the students. He sought to come, come, he came to be with him, to learn from him, to experience his presence. And not just what he taught, he didn't hand out notes, but to experience him. That's why later on by the power of the Holy Spirit, these are the ones who are able to interpret his message because they experience his person. And they could be witnesses, not just to a text, but to the person of Jesus Christ. And that's the dynamic, we come, to receive, we come to listen, we come to be with the one we love. And then we go and witness. And that's the end of the Gospel of Matthew, too, not just the Gospel of Luke, the Gospel of Matthew. For that matter, it's the end of the Gospel of John, and for that matter, the Gospel of Mark. Well, anyway, there we go. You come, go, go, go make disciples. Go make witnesses, disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, sacraments. And teaching them, teaching, word and sacrament. That's the dynamic of the Christian life. We come to experience and we go to witness to the Lord.
And I remember 25 years ago, well, the time was not very quickly, when I became, I was called to be a bishop. And uh, you get to sort of design a logo. So I got a little gold cross and a red background, which is the St. Peter Seminary, where I spent much of my life. But I then put Alpha Omega, Bible and Chalice, Jesus Christ in Word and Sacrament. Worship God, and that's from the uh, Book of Revelation, where I spent two years studying the last 16 verses of the Book of Revelation. When I did my doctorate, I, I'm a slow reader. <laughs> <laughs> two years to read the last 16 verses, but there we are. And that's the dynamic. We come to experience, we come to listen, we come to be with the Lord, and then we go on a mission. And that's the same with Mass. We come together. We are a congregation. We come at the sound of the bells. So we come to be with the Lord. And the last word of Mass, though, is go. Eat them, he says, go. Out into the streets. It's like, it's really basically like the body. You know, I've got doctors here, I'm sure I'm doing this correctly. But, you know, the, the blood comes into the lungs to be purified, then goes back out to do its work, then comes back in again. You go back out to purification, new life, purification, new life, steady too. The heart, sacred heart of Jesus, the heart is steady, steady all the time. It's not extravagant, it's not wild, it's steady. And that's our mission, to come to be with the Lord, to go and be witnesses. We are witnesses of the word. And that's, of course, also very much the case of the vocation ministry. People often say, you know, it's like Father Martin was talking, we happened to knock on the door of Sarah's, uh, and he was coming. And, and uh, as he mentioned in his song, and it happened the priest wasn't there at the time, but there were seminarians there. And they invited him, welcomed him, and they helped him to see. They became witnesses of the priesthood. He saw them, he saw the priesthood. He saw the priest, he saw the priesthood. And this is true. I remember when I was in my former life, when I was a rector of the seminary, I put out a little chart for about 50 seminaries at the time, and I put out a little questionnaire. What inspired you? What brought you to the seminary? What helped you? What witnessed to you, in a sense, to become a seminarian, to try it out? And I put several options. Vocation literature. Zero. Uh, you know, imagery, beautiful pictures, and that, zero. The influence, I was invited by a priest, 45 out of 50. The example of a priest, about 40 out of 50. So it's, it's the witnesses that have always been the ones who bring people to. And that's what we're all called to do in our different ways, to, to witness to Christ in that way. And for me, it was witnesses like uh, Wolf Papa Newstead and, and others, and we all have our different, different ones. And indeed, also, we think of our parents, and we think of the ways people witness to help people in the great vocation of marriage. That's why we have that as a way in formation for marriage, to have people witness. And we experience witness from those we know who are living that vocation as it is meant to be lived. Witness has another side to it, though. In the book of Revelation, which is in the year of the book I spent most of my time studying, Martus, Martaria is the word for witness, martyr. And the first named witness that we know of uh, in that sense, the modern sense, is in the first part of the book of Revelation, Antipas, who gave his life for Christ. But we know the first martyr was Stephen. But there were the first we have mentioned in the book of Revelation, Antipas, was around the year 95. And they used the term specifically used of witness, martus. And that is something that we need to reflect upon. If we are witnessing with integrity to the Lord in a world where, as it says, the, the light came into the darkness and the darkness did not overcome it and the darkness did not grasp it. I think sometimes the best translation of that is that the darkness did not grasp the light. It didn't either conquer it or understand it. We're liable to face martyrs. And we think of, think of those parishioners who came to Mass on Pentecost Sunday in Oloa in Nigeria. Martyr! Martyr! 
congregation. And just a few a bit later, and all over the world, there are more markers in the sense of witnesses in blood now than there ever were. But the blood of martyrs is the seed of the church. Their witness leads to new life because they say, I'm willing to die for Christ. Therefore, are we at least willing to live for Christ? You know, we're not likely to face martyrdom here. We face more kind of being marginalized and laughed at and kind of mocked and all that kind of stuff. They actually, they don't their life for Christ. So being witnesses is, is crucial in our life. Yet it always has been. But we're witnesses of the word. And the word is, as I say, read a chapter a day. It is the word of God. Yes, the word of God is the Bible. The, the Bible is the word of God, but the word of God is more than the Bible. The word is a who, not a what. The word is not paper, but a person. The word is our Lord Jesus Christ. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And the word became flesh and love amongst us. And there's a wonderful thing that became the theme of the Toronto uh, World Youth Day. It was a song for the Toronto. It came out of First uh, John. The one we have seen, the one we have touched, we have... It is the Lord, that excitement. Then that's the someone who has seen and touched and been with him can pass that, can share it. And then that is our joy and your joy. That's what it means. It is the witness to the word who is the Lord. And that means we need an encounter with the Lord, not just, just something abstract. And we see that in the way at the very beginning of the dynamic of the Gospel of John, where we have the Word becoming flesh, and then this spreading outward as people who experience Him want to share Him with others. Jesus Christ in Word and Sacrament. I think of that. I think of that in terms of the Word. There's a, a very great book I used to hand out to my seminarians when I was in my former life <laughs> called Beginning to Pray by Anthony Bloom. Now, Anthony Bloom is an Orthodox Archbishop. And for Orthodox Archbishops, they have deep eyes and long beards. <laughs> and it must be difficult the mirror term practice the eyes and sort of put weights on the, the beard. But he's a very great uh, bishop. He wrote a prayer book on prayer. And he talks about when he was an atheist teenager, which is a phase that teenagers sometimes go through, he thought, well, I'm going to give the church one more chance. I looked for the shortest gospel. I'm going to read the gospel. I'll find the shortest. Mark was the shortest gospel. So he takes it open. He starts reading the Gospel of Mark in a kind of a cynical mode. It's just, okay, I'll read it through, then I'm finished. I'm out the door. But as he began to read the Gospel of Mark, he began to be conscious of the presence of Christ. And that changed his mind. He was reading. He wasn't mastering divinity as that hilarious title of theological studies. That he was encountering Christ. And that's what the lecture to Nina is. It's an encounter with Christ, it's a divine reading, not meant to study or master or com uh, comprehend or whatever, but to experience, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Lord, your servant is listening. Like Samuel in the temple. And that's the word, whom, who we encounter, not what we encounter, who we encounter in the Word of God, and Anthony Bloom experienced that through the reading of the Gospel of Mark. But I noticed this morning, uh, Father Martin spoke of how in his uh, childhood, his father and mother, they went to adoration. And he didn't want to go at first and all, but he went. He went. In a sense, almost obedience. Led him there, but he went. And, he, and it had, as he said, a, a profound influence on him, which he didn't understand at the time, to be before the Lord we love. And I remember when I was a little boy in the Church of Our Lady, which some of you have now seen, uh, we lived right behind the church, and my father would take me to what he had called Nocturnal Adoration Society, it was the, the, the Holy Name Society, they did this, so the men of the parish would spend the night in prayer and, and adoration. And I remember walking with him to that church, kneeling beside him, and just looking at my father to see how, before the Blessed Sacrament, how deeply moved he was. And I remember that, never, I've never forgotten it. Well, I have never forgotten it. But wow, that's something. And just so many people have been deep in their life in Christ through the experience of Eucharistic adoration. 
If there is Eucharistic adoration in a diocese, there are more vocations to the priesthood. It's not magic. It's just obvious. It's just obvious. Kneeling in adoration before our Eucharistic Lord, I mean, hello, you know, there we are. And that's why the great book by Bishop Sheen, which touched my heart when I was a teenager, the priest is not his own. I mean, it's just so obvious to kneel there before the Lord. My Lord and my God. That's how we experience the Lord to whom we witness in our lives. That's important and vital. And Pope Francis mentions, he was heading along to the beach with a bunch of friends as a teenager, and then he decided, I think I'll drop into the church. And so he went in and he dropped, came into, oh, I'll go to confession. And it was the experience of confession, another sacrament, Jesus Christ in word and sacrament, that he really had a profound moment of conversion in his life when drawn to the priesthood. And so we witness to the one we know. We witness, we need to encounter Christ in whatever way, in word, in sacrament, and in the lives of the people around us. And I think there's a model for what the effect of this is. And it is a song that is used, Psalm 95, at the beginning of every day by those who pray for the divine office. Um, and um, it's called the Inventory Psalm. Uh, and uh, I usually, I pray the office frequently on my small bravery here. Um, <laughs> I, I do have batteryless breveries. I do have one. Uh, but I remember it's, it's said uh, that a priest, the last words of a priest if he's dying, is to say to the person, change the ribbons in my bravery. <laughs> to get them to the proper place in case the bishop sees the bravery. He, knows he, was, he was praying the office. <laughs> Uh, in fact, when I when I was just newly ordained, I, I figured, well, I'm not on a training. I was asked to do a retreat for priests when I only been ordained a couple of years. Or what am I going to do? How can I do something useful for all these experienced pastors? So I thought, well, what I do know, I know English literature, I know the Psalms, because I just came from the Biblical. So I've been doing a retreat, I only come the times so on the divine on the Psalms of the divine office, how to pray it more, more effectively. And to because it's wonderful. And it's not just the prayer of the priest, it's the prayer of the church. We, we all are invited to, to pray the divine office in different ways. So I usually do it on this uh, because uh, you, you have big print too. You can get big print. <laughs> I've noticed, now I'm over 75, but I've noticed for a few years that print seems to be getting smaller. <laughs> and people don't talk as loudly as they used to talk. And the quality of fabric is much poorer than when I was young. When I was younger, it was very loose on the body, but now it seems to have kind of probably visiting the shrine of St. Timothy, which uh, Cardinal Lacroix forced me to go to. Um, and to, you know, eat the donut, where you, the way to holiness is through the hole of a donut, and then you begin to get a donut over here. The goal of my life, you know, the reason for a pectoral cross is that a bishop should only be able to see the top of the cross. If you can see the design of the cross, <laughs> it's a sign you need to cut back to the donut. But anyway, I'll get back to that. <clears throat> a little more seriousness here now. A little more seriousness. But here is the psalm that begins the, <laughs> that begins the, the, the day. It's the invitatory psalm. Come ring out our joy to the Lord. Let us hail the rock who saves us. Let us come before him giving thanks. With songs, let us hail the Lord. Let us come before him giving thanks. A mighty God is the Lord, a great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, the heights of the mountains are his. To him belongs the sea, for he made it, and the dry land shaped by his hands. Come in, let us bow and bend low. Let us kneel before the God who made us. For he is our God. And we, the people who belong to his pasture, the flock that is led by his hand. Oh, that today you would listen to his voice. Harden not your hearts as at Meribah, as on that day in Mass in the desert, when your fathers put me to the test, when they tried me, though they saw my work for 40 years. I was weary of these people, and I said, their hearts have gone astray. These people do not know my ways. And then I told, took an oath in my anger, never shall they enter my rest. Have a nice day. <laughs> so that's the opening song. But I think it, it gives us the dynamic of what it is to know the Lord and to witness to him. First of all, the encounter. 
the encounter of extravagant worship of the Lord. Come, let us, come ring out our joy to the Lord. Let us hail the rock who saves us. That's it. We need to dive into our life of faith. That's got to be the start of our witnessing, our experience of the Lord. That's why we do extravagant things when we have expositional of us and We have vestments and candles and songs and things like that. Not because God needs it. God doesn't need any of that. We need it to help remind us of the awesome mystery in which we are engaged, the one we are meeting. Because we can become dull to that through, you know, we can have the crucifix on the wall so much we don't even know it's there. We can pray, Hail Mary, Hail Mary, Hail Mary, Hail Mary, Mary, and we forget the many splendid reality. So we need things. That's why when we pray the songs, by the way, we, we antiphony. If not, we spin around, and we would just go, you know, like at Mass, but once the first reading is over, you forget what it is until you get to the psalm, you forget that when you're on to the second reading, you know, who knows what the gospel is? <laughs> and we just zip along. So there's something we've got to slow down. Come, ring out our joy to the Lord. Hail the God of the rock who saves us. Let us come before him, giving thanks with songs. Let us hail the Lord. We sing in joy. The faith that is sad or mad and not glad is bad. <laughs> That's why in the, in the Divine Comedy, you know, there's no music in hell, except I did it my way. That's <laughs> But in that great book, the Dante, where, you know, they go, he goes, you want to get quick to the, the mystic mountain, woo, you know, get up there. No, no, you gotta, you gotta deal with, slow down, you gotta go to hell and back, you gotta understand. What, but once he gets out of hell, um, there's music. If they're going to the, even the painful mount of purgatory with this purification, they're singing. Because they're together. We sing. You know, as, as Augustine says, he who sings prays twice. Because we sing together. Or we sing alone. I just sing all the time because I love it. I just, you know, ham it up. But I don't know the line. The, the trouble is, I have an embarrassing situation because at most of the masses, we have the St. Michael's Choir School. <laughs> and they actually know music. <laughs> Those little dots on the page have been to them. <laughs> and they always get them perfectly. I just have it up. I just start saying, Come, let us sing to the Lord. Then, important point is God lives in the indicative. It's the verses in imperative. Come, come, imperative. Woo hoo, you know. Ta -da, ta -da, ta -da, that kind of browsing thing. But we do that because. A mighty God is the Lord, a great king of all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, the heights of the mountains are his. To him belongs the sea, for he made it, and the dry land shaped by his hands. God lives in the indicative. He is. He who is. That's what led to the mission of Moses. I am who I am. It's just because we can jazz up, we can get a lot of excitement from well, all kinds of things, uh, you know, little sugar cubes and stuff. This is not really what it's all about. Our enthusiasm, the fact of the Blessed Sacrament, all that pizzazz we put around, is because my Lord and my God, it is the Lord. And in fact, I think the famous uh, Nathaniel O'Connor, when she was at a cocktail party, a great art, uh, writer, and some former Catholic who left the church, uh, it was saying, well, I always loved the Eucharistic thing, you know, it's so splendid, such a wonderful emotional experience and all that. And she said, well, if that's all the Eucharist is, why the hell with it? That's a very dogmatic Catholic statement. It is the Lord. <laughs> it's not just the sex. And the other stuff that comes from it comes from the fact, just like a comet going through the sky, it's that rock at the front, the nugget that makes the big flaming tail go behind it. But you don't have the tail without the nugget in front. And our faith is that. It is the Eucharist. It is the Lord. And that's why we have music and all the other things that come worship and all those other things. Because of the dogmatic fact, as the Newman said, faith without doctrine is like filial love without a father. And that's what we sometimes forget when when our faith becomes relational so much that it becomes morphing here and there and somewhere else without the fact of the reality of the divinity of Christ and the presence of our Lord and the Blessed Sacrament, you get all kinds of wacky things happening, even in, well, in the church. It becomes totally subjective. And it becomes hell. 
Hell is total subjectivity, because there's not no there there. And so a God is, a mighty God is the Lord. And that's the one to whom we witness. If not, forget it. Who wants to die for an emotion? And I think of, for example, I think of our great world, great heroes, uh, witnesses of eight martyrs, uh, Thomas More and John Fisher. They died for the office of Peter. The fact, the office of Peter. When at the time when they were teenagers, the Pope was Alexander the Sixth, so we won't talk much about it. And one of the several, the Leo the Tenth, said, Since God has given us the papacy, let us enjoy it. Uh, not a good inspiration, you know. Or, or Clement the Seventh, when they died, they often they shed their blood for Christ at a time when the immediate experience was not so good because they saw the fact that is the Holy Father. That is the office of Peter. They died for that. And so, too, we live for Christ and we live for the reality. We witness to that, not to just a passing emotion. And because of that, then, come, let us bow and bend low, let us kneel before the God who made us, for he is our God, we the people who belong to his pasture, the flock that is led by his hand. The enthusiasm, the excitement, the joy of our faith comes from the reality, the fact of the presence of God. And most sublimely from in this world that we see him face to face in the Holy Eucharist, in the celebration of the Eucharist, and extending that over time when we're not celebrating Mass in the experience of adoration of our Lord. That's why this touches the hearts. This is why people are drawn to Christ. This is Bishop Sheen is right. Uh, it's so true of him and so many yeah, all the folks have said that. But then it's not enough to say, I witness to the Lord. I love you, Jesus. No, that won't cut it either. Because, oh, that today <clears throat> you would listen to his voice, obey, or obey his voice. It's not enough to be enthusiastic about the Lord, even the fact of the Lord. You've got to show it in your actions. Harden not your heart as in many of As on that day in Mass in the desert when your fathers put me to the test, and they tried me, though they saw my work. At Mary of Mass, remember Moses? Was whacking the rock because he didn't trust his thing. Give yeah, it the second swipe, did him in. You know, he would hit the rock. He said, I don't think it's going to work. So he thought he's whacking away. <laughs> oh, God is in charge. You know, you trust the Lord. It's a lack of trust, it's disobedience. So, and then the Lord says, 40 years, I wanted to vomit them out. That's actually what the Hebrew says. But for 40 years, I'm weary of these people. Their hearts were saying, You do not know my ways. Never shall they enter my rest. It means that basically we need to do what we witness to. We need to be in touch with the fact of the Lord and then let it be shown in our actions, in a life of obedience to the will of God and in joyful service of the Lord. And not to be caught up in our own egos, because that's very easy to do. And I remember one of the, there's something very important about the priesthood that I, I heard when I was a seminarian a couple of years ago. I was, there was an ancient priest, an antique priest who had taught at the seminary in London. He must have been at least 60 years old. <laughs> and he had white hair. But that made him even more antique. He was named Father Durand. And he's the guy who would say, you know, faith is sad or mad and not that is bad. But I never forget the first retreat I ever had as a seminarian. He came in a big cassock. He looked, he's sort of Bishop Sheeney in this style. <laughs> and I was there, oh my gosh, my first retreat was seven. And he looked at us, this was 1969, when priests were leaving the priesthood of one a month or so, you know, boom, boom, and every, they were all having identity crises, uh, which I don't think most of us have the luxury to have, but they were having an identity crisis. And he said to me something that I thought was so profound, he said, gentlemen, a priest cannot have. The identity crisis. <laughs> because a priest does not have an identity. <laughs> oh, wow. He's coming. I had the faintest idea what he meant. <laughs> but I think what he, what he meant was a priest who was trying to figure out his identity, just forget it. Serve the Lord. Do the dishes. Work. 
you'll find your identity. We don't seek our identity and then see if we've lost it somewhere under the bed or wherever it is. <laughs> the priest does not have his ego identity, I identity. Remember the most, uh, the perpendicular pronoun is the Humphrey Apple, we call it I. Perpendicular pronoun yeah. is the killer. It's the center word of pride and sin. <laughs> so the priest who wants to, my priesthood, let me share it with you, a bit about my priesthood. Say, you don't have a priesthood. It's the priesthood of Jesus Christ. The priest is not his own. And I sometimes don't, well, I don't want to get into that. No, <laughs> I'll skip that. I'm talking about some cases I know. If you happen to have a narcissistic priest, that's disastrous. Forget about your, your priesthood. You don't have one. It's the priesthood of Jesus Christ. Just hear confessions. Or maybe not, if you're like that. <laughs> Make a holy hour. Do something. Serve the people. You know? Mm -hmm. So that's the thing. Obedere. Oh, oh, that the day you would listen to his voice, get to work. Get to work. Serve the people. Then you'll discover your priesthood or whatever it is. Same about the Christian life. Happiness never comes in the front door. It always comes in the back door while we're doing something else. If we're serving the Lord, doing our best, we will discover what it means to be a Christian. We will discover what it means to be a mother, a father, brother, sister, whatever. Or a priest, or a bishop, or a cardinal, or whatever. While we're doing the will of the Lord, we'll discover what it means. We don't shape our identity, cherish our identity, and all that kind of nonsense. So, we witness to Christ. And we do it very much. By experiencing him in word and sacrament. And there are two, I uh, oh, I better not do that. Well, by the waters of Babylon is my favorite song, because I tend to Babylon. Babylon. <laughs> <laughs> so I will try to bring this to a close. But there are two great symbols at the ordination of a bishop, the ordination of a deacon. Now, I should point out to you, I'm a very well organized guy. Yeah. And I didn't know until my sister Patsy told me that I was ordained a deacon on May the 14th, 1972. I was ordained a bishop on May the 14th, 1997. On to the day, the 25th anniversary, we ordained a deacon. I like to keep things neat. Um, <laughs> but a bishop, when he's ordained, he has the book of the Gospels kind of held over his head like this by two deacons. And that means that he witnesses by going out from under the gospel of the Lord. The house whose roof, it looks like the roof of a house, whose roof is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. He goes up from that to witness to Christ. But he must come back to that in order to know what he's doing. You have to witness. Who are you witnessing? So you got to consider. It's so much true, deacons and bishops. It's true to all of us, isn't it? That's why... Chapter a day, keeps the bishop away. Read, read the gospel of Jesus Christ. But that's so true. We're called to witness the experience, the encounter, not with an intellectual or whatever, but the encounter of being under the roof of the gospel. That's where our natural home is. Just as our natural home, we go out from our experience of the Eucharist. So that's the first point. I think a symbol and an ordination of a bishop. But the most sublime symbol as well. And I experienced this two days ago, and I'm going to do experience this on Sunday, the ordination of the deacon. When the gospel book is placed in the hands of the deacon, receive the gospel of Christ, whose herald you now are, whose witness you now are, Believe what you read, teach what you believe, and practice what you teach. That's integrity. Receive the gospel of Christ, whose witness, whose herald you now are. Because the deacon is, is mandated to proclaim the gospel formally in the church. But I think we can say that for all of us, isn't that true? We're all witnesses through baptism, confirmation. Go, be my witnesses. That's where, and through word and sacrament. Receive the gospel of Christ, whose witness, whose herald you now are. Believe what you read. It comes from there. It doesn't come from us. We can't check around and say, by the way, what's our faith? You can't just do it that way. It doesn't come like, so we cook one up. What's a better form of the Catholic Church? Can you find one more to my taste? Really? 
no change of life on that, no conversion. No, it is the gospel of Jesus Christ that shakes us to the core, that it calls us, drop everything and follow him, don't follow you. We don't have an I, ego, identity. We find who we are by forgetting who we are, by carrying the cross and dying in to Christ the Lord. So receive the gospel of Christ, whose herald you now are. Believe what you read in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Teach what you believe. That's why we don't cook up the faith when that's when the priest or deacon puts the soul on. It's remember, it's the faith. That's not your faith. That's why. It's, I often think somebody, when somebody says, that was a beautiful mass photo, I, I think they're very kind of them to say that. But I would say, well, nothing comes transubstantiation. <laughs> you know, it's an act of God. Believe what you read, teach what you believe, which is Jesus and his word. Be a witness to what you believe. Don't add in your own, don't let the rather turbid winds of the zeitgeist get messing up in our faith. It's just wind, after all. I don't know why it's a German word. But anyway, zeitgeist, the spirit of the age, you know. Um, no future there. It just goes around in circles. Actually, there's something, a variation of that at the beginning of the Divine Comedy. It's wind, not there. Believe what you read, which is the word, and then practice what you teach. Teach what you believe and practice what you teach, because it's the integrity of the connectedness, the witness we give to the Word, who is Jesus, whom we discover in Word and Sacrament. The witness is shown in authenticity by the integrity of our witness. If who we are is in harmony with what we say, that's the key, because that will witness to people more than even the words we may say. And so we have to, and we, we don't do it, that's what we need to get to confession. Say, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Because so often we need to be repentant. That's why priests and deacons and bishops are flat on the floor with us praying, God forgive them, when, before they get ordained. So you don't let them loose on the people of God until they're flat on the floor. And as they say, you know, two times, priests are flat on the floor, face down at the ordination, face up at the funeral. <laughs> and you hope that, you hope that betwixt one and the other, they have believed what they read, taught what they believe, and practice what they teach, and when they don't, get the confession. And that's why we need to think of that and, and reflect on that. Uh, and then we will, by God's grace, be witnesses. That's what we're called to be, all of us. And that's what the sermons pray for. That all of us, and that the priests who are ordained, and bishops, and deacons, and others, those in the religious life, will be living with integrity. An integer is not a fraction. A fraction is divided. We need to live with integerity. We need to be all the way through, simple all the way through, not split a bit for me and a bit for Jesus, all the way through to the Lord. So I think, well, those are a few thoughts on witnessing to the Word. And I uh, pray the Lord uh, keep me in your prayers as you are in mine. Amen. Amen.